Hello and welcome to another episode of Full Court Finance here at Zacks. I'm your host, Ben Rains. And today we're taking a look at two tech stocks that could be long-term winners to consider buying as we head into March. And those two stocks are Taiwan Semiconductor and Netflix. But before we get everything, remember to subscribe uh, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcast and make sure to check out our zacks.com slash promo page for a look into some of our services, portfolios, and more. So before we jump into Netflix and Taiwan Semiconductor, I want to do just a really rapid market recap just to give everyone a sense of what's going on. Uh, so the PCE data came out Thursday morning roughly in line with Wall Street expectations. As I'm recording this Thursday afternoon, the S&P 500 was up about 0.10%, and NASDAQ was up about uh, a quarter of a percent. So kind of not not much. The market's cooled off a bit in the last week of February, which was certainly welcome after we had gone on such a big run. So still, though, a near-term pullback seems like it will be healthy to kind of help trim some of the VAT. That said, the bulls remain in total control and investors should be ready to possibly take advantage of any selling that comes in, the, say, the coming days or weeks as we get back to any of those 21-day or 50-day moving averages. Those should be some bullish lines in the sand to keep their eyes out for because the overall backdrop remains really sturdy. S&P 500 earnings growth looks really impressive this year. Everyone's still expecting the Fed to cut rates at some point. And actually, it's pretty bullish if the Fed slowly cuts rates because if they end up having to chop rates really quickly, it often means that something went really wrong with the economy. So it's a good sign if they only have to slowly churn out rate cuts over the next few years. And then obviously everyone's really excited about all this AI-driven growth and productivity gains. So overall, as I said, uh, we could expect a little bit of a pullback in the coming days or weeks, which is a healthy aspect of all markets, but the bulls seem to remain firmly in control of the market at the moment. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look uh, at two of these stocks. And the first one is Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Co., which trades under the ticker TSM. Uh, people call it Taiwan Semi, TSMC, various things. So we're going to call it whatever we want as we go through this. But Taiwan Semi is the largest and most dominant chip manufacturer in the world. Its foundries physically build the most cutting-edge semiconductors that drive smartphones, data centers, AI, and nearly every advanced technology because chips are the lifeblood of all tech. Taiwan Semi produces roughly 60% of the world's semiconductors and over 90% of the most advanced ones. That's just massive market share. That 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 fact alone uh, is kind of the the long term pitch for Taiwan Semi. Uh, it boasts clients such as Nvidia and Apple, and it's driving forward in the five nanometer production world. It's rolling out a ton of next generation three nanometer chips uh, in Q4, its most recent quarter. Uh, three nanometer accounted for 15% of its total Wayfair revenue, with five nanometer, which is also still pretty cutting edge, about 35%. The company is reaping the rewards of its founding principle, which was manufacturing only. So the company's moat is really huge considering the institutional know-how involved in building these factories and then actually building the chips themselves and the enormous costs. Uh, it's one of really the only pure play chip manufacturers, and it's actively expanding outside of Taiwan for relatively obvious reasons, uh, geopolitical concerns. But uh, it's, yeah, it's just always good to expand its reach, and it's certainly doing that at the moment. Uh, though it's, it's facing some near-term construction setbacks in the U.S., uh, given the complexity of the task, which actually shows why Taiwan Semi is such a strong stock that uh, they're, they're having a lot of delays building a big plan in Arizona, uh, spurred by U.S. government incentives to try to build more chips actually in America. But they're having a hard time building this fabrication plant because just of the complexity, and we haven't done something like this in the U.S. at this level in a long time. So that will be built at some point. It's just facing some delays, which I, I see as bullish, just considering uh, how tough it is to actually do what they're doing. And then uh, considering those geopolitical tensions I mentioned, in late February, the company opened uh, its majority-owned subsidiary, Japan Advanced Semiconductor. So they're expanding outside of Taiwan, which another, as I said, a, a great sign for any investors who are nervous about possibly getting into Taiwan Semi because of those geo geopolitical fears. So in terms of their growth, they did 18% revenue growth between uh, 2018 and 2022, including 29% expansion in 2022. Uh, 
then 2023 was a cyclical down year. That's pretty common in the wider chip space. Uh, the company, though, topped our Q4 estimates in late January and provided upbeat guidance with its the, the quote saying its fourth quarter business was supported by the continued strong ramp of industry leading three nanometer technology. So looking ahead in 2024, we're calling for 23 percent revenue growth from 69 billion all the way up to 85 billion. And then we're calling for another 20% growth next year to get up to 102 billion. So really big back-to-back -back years of a strong return to top line growth. And then on the bottom line, we're calling for 19% adjust earnings growth in 2024, and then another 24% adjust earnings growth next year in 2025. And since its release, it's seen some upward earnings revisions. So for the current quarter, uh, its revisions or its estimates up 10%. It's up 10% for Q2, and then overall it's up about 7% for fiscal 2024, and then up about 4% for 2025. So some positive earnings revisions, though it still lands a Zach's rank number three hold at the moment. And then in terms of its stock price, the company has crushed the tech sector over the last 10 years, up about 580% versus 280% for the wider tech space. Uh, but it has underperformed during the past year, up 44% versus 52% for the wider tech sector, and it still trades nearly 10% below its all-time highs, which is a bullish sign as many of these big tech names race higher and higher to new and new heights. Uh, on a technical standpoint, it's trading slightly above its 21-day moving average, having pulled back recently. Uh, it's trading at around neutral RSI levels. And then on a longer term time frame, it might be a little overheated. So we could see a bit of a pullback since it's trading pretty solidly above its 21 week moving average uh, at some more heavily overbought RSI levels. But if you're a longer term investor, you don't need to worry about trying to time these things uh, exactly as uh, <clears throat> it just ends up proving to be far more difficult and end up costing you on big wins of the long run if you try to get in and out of these stocks at the exact right moment. Because if you're an investor for, say, a couple of years or a couple of decades, it's not going to matter exactly when you got in. And then valuation-wise, uh, Taiwan Semi is trading at a 25% discount to the broader tech sector at 19.9 times forward Taiwan earnings and 40% below its own 10-year highs. The company also pays a dividend and boasts a pretty sturdy balance sheet. And seven of the nine brokerage recommendations that Zax has are strong buys. So overall, uh, the bullish case for Taiwan Semi is that it's actually builds the chips. There's not many competitors. It's at the cutting edge of the cutting edge of semiconductors. Uh, it has the biggest clients in the world, and uh, it it's going to benefit from chip growth for years and decades to come, AI, data centers, all that. And it doesn't really matter who ends up being the winner in any of these spaces. They're going to they're gonna benefit from all of that growth. Uh, and in full disclosure, I owned a Taiwan Semi in my own personal portfolio. And now moving on to another stock that we're the other of the two big tech stocks we're talking about today outside of these those big magnificent seven names is Netflix. It, it used to be part of uh, that FANG thing, but now it's, it's kind of fallen out of favor, even though the stock kind of looks as, as strong as ever. Uh, it's beyond its big, big, big growth days, but we'll get dive into why it might be worth considering Netflix, which trades in the ticker NFLX. So Netflix obviously changed the entertainment industry forever, uh, altering the way people watch movies, TV shows, that Vanguard status and growing content library have helped it maintain its edge over Disney, Apple, Amazon, and every other company who's now in the streaming business. Yet the stock got crushed for slowing top line expansion and fears about that growing competition, as well as worries about possible consolidation in the streaming industry and other things. Uh, Netflix has addressed a lot of those anxieties, uh, crushing membership estimates throughout 2023. Most recently, it added 13.1 million net new paid subscribers in the fourth quarter, which it reported in late January, which was 50% more than Wall Street had projected, reaching about 260 million global subscribers. Better yet, uh, the company had never uh, added a single, they had never had more uh, subscribers in a single quarter uh, outside of the first quarter of 2020, which was when the COVID outbreak hit. So that really just showcased how great last quarter was. Uh, it actually added more subscribers on its own than Wall Street had predicted for Netflix, Disney, 
uh, Warner Brothers Discovery and Paramount combined for the period. So it was a, a blowout fourth quarter. Uh, they're also significantly ramping up their investment in live programming, which is going to kind of be the other reason to get people to continue to subscribe. Uh, a lot of these services are trying to obviously get live sports rights as kind of the last uh, horizon of streaming. The only thing that people still, lots of the reasons people still have cable is for sports. So if people are able to also stream sports, that could be a big thing. So Netflix earlier this year announced a 10 year deal with WWE that will bring uh, popular wrestling shows such as raw to Netflix in the U S and certain other markets. So certainly worth considering. And as I said, yeah, they added about 13 million subscribers in the fourth quarter to get up to over 260 million. And it was a, another blowout quarter in terms of uh, coming in well above subscriber growth estimates. The company is far above uh, Disney Plus, which had about 111 million subscribers, which was actually down uh, from the previous quarter. And overall, Disney Plus Hulu has about 150 million. So Netflix is way bigger than that business. Uh, Netflix lower cost ad tier is gaining traction as well with some big user growth, as I said, and it's also expanding into video games and it's working to cut down on people sharing accounts as well, which has all helped its growth. And looking into that growth, the company did about 7% revenue growth last year and 7% growth in 2022, which was a big slowdown from their massive growth of double digits before that. But looking ahead, we're calling for kind of a return to stronger growth. So we're calling for 14% growth in 2024 to get up to about $39 billion, and then another 12% growth on the top line in 2025 to get all the way up to $43 billion. And then Wall Street's loving that it's focusing more on the bottom line, as a lot of these former growth at all cost tech companies have done. And we're calling for 41% adjusted earnings growth in 2024 and then another 22% growth on the bottom line next year. And like with Taiwan Semi, it's seen some impressive upward revisions since its last report. Its outlook for 2024 is up about 6% in terms of its overall consensus estimate on the bottom line, and then 8% higher for 2025. This actually helps it land a Zach's ranked number one strong buy at the moment. And then in terms of its stock price over the last decade, it's up about 840%. And it's still trading, though, 15%, roughly 15% below its all-time highs. So Taiwan Semi and Netflix both still not back at their all-time highs, even though we have NVIDIA and all these other big tech players racing to higher and higher highs. Uh, and that is despite, though, it's up 90% in the last year. And it had a big post-release jump. So on the technical front, is trading solidly above its 21-week moving average, as a, kind of a lot of the market is. The S&P 500 in general is trading solidly above its 21-week moving average. So we could see a pullback at some point in the near future. But as we said at the top, the bullish case remains. And so if you if you want to wait for a possible pullback to get in, but if you're a longer-term investor, you don't need to really worry about timing things exactly. And then it's also trading solidly above its 21-day moving average. Average and at some somewhat overheated RSI levels. Though on the valuation front, it's trading at a 90% discount to its own highs at 34 times forward earnings and 50% below its 10 year median. So, valuation wise, looking pretty sturdy. So, Netflix is another one of uh, these stocks outside of that magnificent seven group of big tech names that gets all the love these days to consider buying and holding for your long term portfolio. And that does it for another episode of Full Court Finance. Until next time, I'm your host, Ben Rains. And remember, if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot us an email over at podcast at zax.com. This material is being provided for informational purposes only, and nothing herein constitutes investment, legal, accounting, or tax advice, or a recommendation to buy, sell, or hold a security. Do not act or rely upon the information and advice given in this podcast without seeking the services of competent and professional legal, tax, or accounting counsel. Publication and distribution of this podcast is not intended to create, and the information contained herein does not constitute an attorney-client relationship. No recommendation or advice is being given as to whether any investment or strategy is suitable for a particular investor. It should not be assumed that any investments in securities, companies, sectors, or markets identified and described were or will be profitable. All information is current as of the date herein and is subject to change without notice. Any views or opinions expressed may not reflect those of Zach's investment research as a whole.